Uh, hi, everybody. Dr. Kogan GW, Center for Together Medicine, George Washington University. I uh, want to feature today a topic which is very close to what I do a lot in the clinic. So I, I see a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease. And this is the news that from yesterday that were featured in MedPage. MedPage is a pretty well-known resource that, that I try to track closely. It, it, it puts out the news on all most important medical topics. So this particular med, uh, med page from, from Tuesday, March 21st, highlights the fact that there's a now a very strong evidence linking exposure to TC or trichloroethylene and also PC, which is perchloroethylene, which is a very close closely related chemicals to a very high risk of Parkinson's disease. The article that was just published a couple of weeks ago uh, in Journal of Parkinson's Disease, this is the article and it's titled Trichloroethylene, an Invisible Cause of Parkinson's Disease. So I, I actually think that this study uh, and this news are going to be um, creating a pretty big stir in the medical community, particularly in neurology um, or in, in, in field that takes care of patients with Parkinson's disease. So, um, so this study shows that the link is very strong. There's a whole lots of cases reported in this particular study, but more importantly, it highlights the whole of the history of this chemical. It talks about what the chemical is. Uh, it's a very simple six atom carbon chemical that is a solvent and it's present in all kinds of typical uh, environmental, um, in, in all kinds of environments, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and uh, it's been known to EPA for a very long time. So the first concern about this started appearing at least 50 years ago. And um, uh, of course, those of, those of you who've been tracking Camp, Camp, Camp Lejeune, which is the um, exposure to a large amount of soldiers that followed with a massive uh, um, health concerns and uh, the fact that the VA is now covering all of the um, exposed veterans' health problems at the 100% if they were in, in the camp and then they developed problems. It's been known for many, many years. So I find it surprising that I would consider myself uh, an expert in this topic that this is news to me or big news to me. I'll tell you in a second why that is a big news and why I, this was flying under my radar for quite some time. So as you can see, um, I'm going to show you the list where it comes from. So it's a very long list, all kinds of typical things inside your house. Um, if you know, if you're using, particularly if you drink non-organic decaffeinated coffee, uh, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're exposed to a high amount of TC. Uh, it's right here. Or in terms of other foods, uh, it's very commonly present in. Um, uh, one second, there was another important food that uh, it was very common in. Actually, sorry, not the food. It's it's in the uh, dry cleaners. So if you're using dry cleaners, it's one of the biggest. Um, uh, that's one of the exposures. Um, mold releases, lubricants. I mean, it's a very big list of where you can get TCE from. Um, it actually also present in a lot of pharmaceutical drugs uh, in some traces. So it's probably not necessarily um, something that's present in a high amount in, in particularly uh, in, in particular medications, but still can be present. Uh, oh, uh, that's what I meant to say. It's uh, in the, a lot of different spices and flavors. So when they extract it, the TCE, if it's non-organic extraction, uses this. Oh, and also a lot of different non-nicotine nicotine containing uh, vaping and smoking products, all of them going to have some of the amount of TCE. There's a long list of cases here. And, um, you know, in terms of where in the US you can find it, pretty much in every state, this is some of the level, some of the cities where TCA in air in a very high amount. And then this is the um, most of the TCA re released very recently. This is a long time ago, so it's probably not relevant, 1987, but this is recent. So this is 2020. You can see that it's a pretty wide scope of locations, Tennessee, Kansas, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Ohio. So, you know, lots of different things, different places. Chicago even has some, that's a big city. Um, and so, so what does all this mean um, in terms of for you? So if you 
your loved one, your friend have Parkinson's disease, should you tell them about this? And I think the answer is yes, you should for two reasons. So one problem with assessing toxicity is the fact that there's very little way of common knowledge. So I routinely screen all of my patients with Parkinson's disease for toxic exposure, but I wasn't screening for this. Um, I have some patients in my practice that I know for fact have been exposed to this. For example, I have one, one patient who was in military and, and so we've been trying to figure out whether he's exposed. So we tried to do some tests with, for him, which, which were not conclusive, uh, but we didn't assess specifically TC. So it turns out I was doing some research before this video that the Quest, uh, it's a very large common lab, does have a way of checking TC in the urine and the blood. So if you are my patient or if you want to send someone you love to me, uh, by all means, I will be able to assess for this now, actually through just the, even our insurance coverage uh, to do that. Um, and should we test everybody? So should we test every patient with Parkinson uh, for TC in the urine and the blood? And there's no easy answer to this question because, of course, there's no recommendations. In fact, the current EPA recommends against screening anybody. You know, and you should ask a very important question. So... Um, if you're gonna screen someone, um, the TC half-life in the body is only about two to three days, roughly. Now, what's interesting is that TC half-life in the biologic systems outside of us, so in the ground, in the water, uh, actually can be upwards of a year. Um, so that means that it's a half-life, right? So if you have a spill in a particular area and uh, because the chemical was released for whatever reason, let's say that they were preparing something uh, for in industrial reasons, but then there's a leak. So massive amount got spilled over. So I'm talking particularly about the camp, camp, famous Camp, camp Lejeun. Um, so in a year, roughly, the level will be halved. And then in the year, it will be halved from that, et cetera. But that's a long time. So if you continuously exposed to some amount, but your capacity to detoxify it on average is, say, two to five days, uh, it's a pretty slow process. What that means is that if your exposure is constant, there is a decent chance you're toxic. How do you figure that out? Well, that's the problem. The problem is we don't know outside of checking the level and, and it has not been a standard of care. So nobody has been doing that. There's no easy way to, to figure that out. So what I'm going to start doing, I'm probably going to offer the patients who I think uh, may have a, a, a recent level, I will start offering them this test. Uh, and then I can give an update in six to 12 months on the on my channel just to see where, uh, where that work let us uh, meantime of course i think we should all track this information i i hope that uh, both epa and cdc take this uh, new publication seriously and then there's this, at least some more public awareness and i'm also going to talk to some of my friends experts in this field and see what their opinion is maybe i'll bring someone to the um to this channel to see if they would want to talk to me about it and and provide their expertise hope everybody have a good day i'll see you soon Take care. Bye.